Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us on today's uh, presentation on the subject of STEAM. Uh, my name is Dan Wells. I'm the National Consultant Specialist for Spirax Sarco, and today's presentation has been kindly facilitated uh, by uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Brian Lawson, who's the Technical Manager for Project Solutions, who have got offices in Brighouse, West Yorkshire, and also up in Teesside. Uh, they're a small family-run organisation that specialises in uh, EPC design work for a number of different process applications. I'd also like to thank uh, Fiona uh, at iMickey uh, head office down in Birdcade Watch, Birdcade Watch, London. And I'd also like to thank Nikki Baxter from iMickey West Yorkshire. I'd like to thank both of them for facilitating and arranging today's presentation. So previously, uh, Spirax Sarko have presented at the invitation of iMickey on a number of different subjects around the wider steam and condensate loop. Starting back in March, when we looked at um, different ways that we need to, to give thought to uh, both generating and distributing steam, and then we moved across the steam and condensate loop to look at other topics, such as the use of steam for heat exchange purposes, steam trapping, condensate recovery, and when we met two weeks ago, we looked at different ways that steam could um, steam systems could be optimized to ensure that we were utilizing the steam in our various processes as efficiently as we could. And today we're going to take one step further and we're going to look at how steam engineering is likely to take shape in the future years to address a number of different sustainability issues uh, and concerns that there typically can be with regards to um, steam systems. It's a conceptual as opposed to a technical presentation. So it's really looking at what's likely to be possible with regards to steam engineering, not necessarily looking at solutions that are readily available today. So we've introduced Spirox Sarco in some detail previously. Um, the one thing I would like to draw to your attention is that very useful suite of calculators and configurators that are downloadable to your iPhone, to your smartphone, your Android phone in the form of a free of charge app. And that's got some very, very powerful tools there that are useful for two reasons. First of all, to help you uh, design a steam distribution system. For example, sizing the steam pipes, the condensate pipes, sizing the control valves and the steam traps correctly. But as far as this particular presentation is concerned, which is featuring on energy conservation, sustainability, carbon reduction, those calculators and configurators will also help you to put a financial cost on the mass of steam that is generated. And once we understand the cost of steam, we're going to help to understand uh, the advantages and the benefits that we can bring to the steam using plant by not only reducing steam demand, but also increasing the amount of condensate that can be returned and by minimizing the amount of plant steam that could be vented to atmosphere in the form of leaking steam traps and also by reducing the amount of flash steam that may otherwise be vented away. So I'd strongly encourage you to download those apps if at all possible please do download the Spirax Arco Mexico app as it's got more functionality on it than the UK and Republic of Ireland uh, version. And of course, you can change the units and the language back to English if you should so choose. So we've spoken previously about how to optimize an existing steam network to improve upon system design. And that system could have been developed before climate change was even a consideration. And today we're going to look at concepts that can be introduced that are going to take uh, a typical or traditional steam net uh, network to the very next level and address the challenges that we're likely to face in the coming years. So please, as I've mentioned previously, please consider this um, a kind of tomorrow's world presentation to give you an understanding with regards to the concepts that are likely to be able to employed onto an existing steam distribution network. So um, the Spirox Sarco group of companies has got three distinct divisions. And I work for the Steam Specialties Division, which incorporates Spirox Sarco and also Gestra. But 
what's perhaps of interest and relevant to this particular presentation is the fact that over the past five years, we've acquired a number of companies to really complement uh, the steam specialties division. And that incorporates the electric thermal solutions division, which takes in Chromalux and, and Thermocoax. And this brings Spirax Sarco a huge advantage in being able to diversify our offering and start to look at how we can adapt to produce steam as efficiently and sustainably as we possibly can using new and innovative technologies. So we're going to look at not only the challenges that industry is currently facing, but we're going to move on to look at how we can improve upon traditional working practices to design a new steam distribution network or, or even optimize an existing steam distribution system to realize these objectives that we have. So we appreciate that steam is used in a very, very diverse and varied use of um, applications and it's used in a number of different industries um, ranging from food beverage pharmaceutical to power generation to building services and each of these sectors are going to be utilizing steam in different ways so of course they're going to have a number of different challenges but one common challenge that all of these sectors have is really covered in some detail in the UK's recent um, energy white paper, which was published by the government at the end of last year. And that really reiterates the British government's goal for industry to realize a 90% reduction of carbon emissions by the year 2050. So that's just 29 years away. It's not a great deal at all. And it really reminds us why we need to up our game and focus on realizing those objectives very, very quickly. And the report goes on to look at some detail in all areas of energy consumption, ranging from like transport, transport is on. To, to building, building services, services to, to industry. industry. And, and whilst we've seen some, some progress, progress in recent, in recent years, years, in areas, in areas such as a move towards electricity, as a source of utilizing fuel for road vehicles and the use of renewables for building services, for example. Well, the use of energy in the process sector is really lagging behind by some considerable margin. So as an, as an organization, Spirax Sarco, like so many other organizations, we recognize that because we're part of the FTSE for Good Index, that's a number of FTSE 100 companies that really come together to push forward a, a robust sustainability strategy. We recognize that we've got to give ourselves an even more challenging deadline in order to achieve our own goals. And we recognize that we need to do likewise in order to encourage and um, allow our clients to achieve the same objectives. So the sooner we can all start to transition into using thermal energy more sustainably, then the sooner we can all realize our individual and collective challenges. I think the bottom line is that this problem simply isn't going to go away. But we all know that the vast majority of industrial applications, they're going to have a requirement for utilizing thermal energy at temperatures far in excess of what low temperature hot water can provide. And this means that sources of low temperature hot water that can be readily provided from ground source or air source heat pumps, and they're widely promoted in the building services sector. But whenever we're looking at industrial applications that need higher temperature sources of heat energy, then heat pumps simply aren't going to cut it. So simply put, there's always going to be an industrial requirement for steam in a significant number of process applications. We just need to be more innovative about how we generate, control, distribute, and ultimately use that steam. So when it comes to looking at how we use the steam at the process, at the heat exchanger, we want to reduce the amount of steam that is being consumed. It's what we refer to as demand reduction. Because of course, if we're using less steam, 
then that means that we need to consume less fuel to generate that steam, which ultimately results in fewer carbon emissions. So in order for us to understand how we can um, realize that objective, I want to go back to the basics once more. And this is a slide that we've shown previously, and it really does bear repeating because before we can move on to look at the solutions that are currently under development that can help steam be generated and utilized more efficiently, we need to understand the basic properties of steam that are going to form the cornerstone of how those various solutions are able to work efficiently. So the key piece of information that is demonstrated on the steam tables, it, it remains that understanding that water, which is the raw ingredient of a steam system, that water has got a specific heat capacity of 4.19, which ultimately means that if we want to increase one kilogram of water by just one degree, we need to add 4.19 kilojoules of energy to it. So if we're bringing water up to boiling point, um, the box that is demonstrated in orange shows how much energy we need to add to that water. If we're boiling the water at zero bar gauge, where the boiling temperature is 100 degrees, we need to add 419 kilojoules of energy to it. We refer to that as the enthalpy of water. We can refer to it as the sensible heat. That doesn't give us steam, it gives us boiling water. In order to turn that boiling water into steam, it needs to evaporate. So we then add what we refer to as the enthalpy of evaporation. That's the energy that's demonstrated in the box in blue on the screen that you can see. So for example, at zero bar gauge, when we've added 2,257 kilojoules of energy to a kilogram of water at boiling point, containing 419 kilojoules of energy, that's when that kilogram of water will fully change state, evaporate, and produce a kilogram of steam. But it's important to bear in mind that when that steam reaches a heat exchanger, it condenses, it gives up its heat energy, it changes state from a gas to liquid. But it's only that enthalpy of evaporation, that latent heat, it's the energy shown in the box in blue that is transferred across into the process. So that means that that liquid condensate, that byproduct of heat exchange, is exactly the same as the amount of energy that we added to the water to bring it up to boiling point. We've mentioned in previous presentations that that sensible heat, that condensate, it doesn't have any heat that can be considered useful by the process. So to a certain extent, it can be considered as a byproduct. But what you'll remember from previous presentations is, there's still a considerable amount of heat energy contained within that condensate. We just need to be more creative about how we find a way to utilize that energy. And this will become apparent as we go through the coming slides. We also know that we've got that pressure to temperature relationship that exists in both the steam and the condensate. So when we're distributing steam under pressure, let's say 10 bar gauge, we know that the temperature of the steam is 184 degrees. But if we want to utilize steam at a lower temperature at the process, let's say we've got a heat exchanger that only requires 132 degrees of energy on the primary side. Well, we can achieve that temperature simply by reducing the pressure. That reminds us why it's very, very easy to control uh, the steam output at the process by nothing more than manipulating the pressure. But the other thing that the pressure to temperature relationship demonstrates is the point at which steam gives up its heat energy and condenses. So if we've got any heat loss that exists when the steam's under pressure, for example, in the distributing pipework, well, we know that the steam that condenses in the distribution pipework at 10 bar gauge the temperature of the condensate is going to exist at the same point, 184 degrees. And when we've reduced the pressure of the steam to satisfy the process down to two bar gauge or 132 degrees, the condensate will exist at the same temperature as the steam 
if we know the pressure. So the condensate can only exist as a liquid at that high temperature because of the pressure. So it reminds us that when steam gives up its heat energy and condenses, we've got a phase change. That latent heat energy enters the process. What's held back in the condensate is that sensible heat, but there isn't an exchange of temperature. And we also know that there's another relationship to take into account. There's the pressure to volume relationship. So if we're distributing a kilogram of steam at a high pressure, 10 bar gauge, for example, it's going to occupy a volume of approximately 0.177 cubic meters. But if we reduce the pressure of that steam at the process in order to satisfy the temperature requirements on the secondary side by reducing the pressure, then the volume is going to expand considerably. And this reminds us why we've got a benefit of keeping the steam at a high pressure. But it also reminds us why we need to size the distribution pipe work accordingly. So if we get a fall in pressure of the condensate, then we know that any sudden fall in pressure is likely to result in that flash steam being generated. And as that flash steam is generated, we're going to see a sudden expansion as a result of the phase change. And that's why that flash steam is so often vented to atmosphere that's indicative of a, 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 an energy loss. Simply put, because there's as much heat energy present within that flash steam, we either want to find a way to minimize the creation of that flash steam or identify a way that it can be reused. Simply put, a fall in condensate pressure will result in that flash steam. So now we understand the basic principles, Let's move forward and look at ways that we may be able to generate steam more efficiently in the future years. So it all starts in the boiler house or the energy center, the point of steam generation. And way back in March, when we undertook the first presentation in the series, Steam Fundamentals, we looked at some considerable detail with regards to how steam is generated in a traditional horizontal fire tube boiler. And we know that we're either going to use typically heavy oil, or we may even use gas to generate the steam. It's typically reliant upon fossil fuels. So we know that this is one area which is going to result in significant carbon emissions. And we know this is something that the industry is under the spotlight for. Now, the unfortunate thing is that for many engineers, steam and, and fossil fuels, the, the considered one and the same. And it, we often struggle to get past the understanding that steam is not dirty or efficient or difficult to control. Quite often, it's just the fact that it's the fuels that have traditionally been used to generate steam that are. In other words, we need to be a little bit more creative about the fuels that we utilize to generate steam. So. 95% of all steam is currently generated from using natural gas. And quite understandably, there's a lot of funding around in the UK at the moment and a lot of projects on the horizon that are currently ongoing. And they're looking at different ways in which we can utilize hydrogen as an alternative fuel source. And we know that hydrogen's clean burning. It means that basically, when we burn hydrogen and oxygen together, the byproduct is water vapor. So there's no harmful emissions. And if there's no harmful emissions, then there's no carbon permits to give thought to. So hydrogen and steam have got a very, very good fit because hydrogen could potentially be distributed in an existing natural gas infrastructure. So when it's available to the steam using plant locally, it would just be a case of retrofitting a new hydrogen burner onto an existing steam boiler. So potentially we could utilize the same steam boiler, the same steam distribution network, the same setup in the energy center. It would just be a case of retrofitting out the burner on the boiler itself. But even if there isn't a hydrogen network available locally, then perhaps we could look at producing hydrogen on site using renewable energy to electrolyze the water, and it could then be introduced to the existing steam boiler locally. 
the idea is that we can utilize a brand new source of fuel without a reliance upon completely configuring the traditional steam boiler house. So other ways that we can generate steam uh, safely, efficiently, and sustainably is by using um, electrical energy, by using power to convert to thermal energy. And this is where one of our subsidiary companies that I introduced previously, Chromalox, come in. So if we can use one of their electrical elements to generate steam from electricity, then some of the benefits that we have are, well, there's no open flame to consider. And if there's no open flame and no heat pipes to consider, there's no risk of that steam boiler overpressurizing if there were to be a catastrophic failure. And a traditional fossil fuel burner, that's typically going to operate with an efficiency level of approximately 85%. Whereas an electrical element, that's going to operate with an efficiency level of very, very close to 100%. And a traditional fossil fuel burner, it's going to have an efficiency that depends upon a number of different assumptions, such as the percentage load it's operating on, demand cycling, seasonal variation, soot build upon nozzles, for example. And they're also sized upon an assumption that the boiler is operating on a full load capacity. Therefore, the, that efficiency level is going to fall whenever the demand for steam falls. Traditional burners, they're also going to require additional ancillaries and controls, such as air blowers, for example. They're all going to come at an additional capital cost and an additional cost for maintenance and, and inspection. And we also know that the controls on a traditional fossil fuel boiler, they're going to require greater downtime. They're going to have um, emissions or, or, or soot or, or even ash to contend with. They're going to have an additional burden of testing and supervision. And we know that we can minimize that downtime, the testing and supervision requirements, if we can move towards generating steam from an electrical element, largely down to the fact that it's got zero moving parts. It's also going to be easier to fully automate that boiler house. So a medium voltage system, it's an ideal solution for steam using plant that are going to have a requirement for around about 880 kilowatts or greater. And it's really just a question of ensuring that the appropriate electrical heater element is selected in order to match the required mass of steam that's required by the process. So an electrical generator can very easily be incorporated again into an existing steam boiler house as perhaps the steam, the fossil fuel steam burner can be retrofit with the appropriately sized electrical element. In other words, we can carry on using the same steam boiler, the same infrastructure, the same distribution network, and maybe even the same water treatment plant. And that's because very, very similar uh, water treatment levels, do you remember? We refer to that as the total dissolved solid content or the TDS levels. They're going to be very, very similar. So once again, it's likely to be a possibility that we can simply retrofit the traditional boiler utilized in fossil fuels. We can retrofit the burner that furnishes the boiler with either hydrogen or an electrical heater element in order to generate steam sustainably from an alternative fuel source. The thing to bear in mind is we're not making the claim here that it will be more cost effective to generate steam from uh, electricity. We're making the claim that we can generate green steam. We're making the claim that by generating steam from a sustainable source of energy, that energy is going to be green and we're also making the claim that we're going to have significantly less emissions to give thought to and we can have other benefits such as a reduction of downtime and a, a, a lessening of the burden of maintenance on the distribution network. Moving forwards we can look at generating steam from a thermal store. So just playing the little animation that you can see on the screen at the moment it really reminds us that in certain cases, we can use a thermal store to supplement 
the generation of steam from alternative sources. For example, if we're, if we're using renewable energy, it could be from aerothermal or, or maybe even solar power. We can use that power to charge a source of hot water that's held under storage. And by elevating that pressurized water to a high temperature, well, it means that we can go back to those basic principles that we've looked at previously. If we've got a, a, a volume of, or a mass of high temperature, high pressure hot water that's held in storage until it's required, well, simply by reducing the pressure of that pressurized hot water, we're going to produce that flash steam that we've spoken about. And we know from previous presentations that there's just as much energy present in flash steam as there is in plant steam. And that can be taken away to satisfy a number of different processes. So this would work very, very well if we've got a process that's got um, a sudden requirement for a, a relatively large mass of steam in a very short period of time. It can supplement a steam using process, but it wouldn't necessarily uh, replace a traditional steam boiler that's utilizing um, an alternative source of fuel altogether. Moving forwards, we need to give thought to how we're utilizing the steam. We need to give thought to how we're using that energy at the process, possibly even look at how we can reduce the demand. And if we move forwards, we can look at different ways where we can use maybe even waste heat more efficiently. We know that a lot of sites that are utilizing thermal energy may not use steam. They may utilize thermal energy from other sources. They may not have steam on site, but they may still have a significant amount of waste heat energy that's put to waste in the form of effluent. And we know that a lot of these industrial processes, they can reject a significant amount of waste heat. And this is often going to be at temperatures that are relatively low, lower than most traditional methods of heat recovery can make use of. So one of the problems is that not only is this a waste of heat energy, but quite often this waste heat energy then has to undergo some form of cooling before it can be disposed of, which is gonna further add to the costs. For example, if it has to be put across a, a cooling tower. So a traditional organic ranking cycle based heat recovery system, that's only gonna be able to make use of temperatures in excess of 120 degrees or, or thereabouts. Whereas a, a controlled phase cycle or a CPC, that can make use of the energy in waste or effluent at temperatures as low as 70 degrees. Now, obviously, the higher the temperature, the greater the rewards are, are going to be. But if we can drop the temperature of the waste to 70 degrees or below and utilize that energy in some of the form, we're going to have significant benefits. And that's where the CPC or the control phase cycle concept really comes in. And a CPC is it's basically a skid mounted solution that um, it allows um, the high temperature effluent to cause a phase change of a refrigerant gas. And that expanding gas can then can then turn a turbine to generate a small amount of electrical energy before that refrigerant gas is then cooled and the effluent has lowered in temperature and passed away to waste. So the cost benefit is measured partly in the electricity that's generated, but mainly as the reduction in cooling costs as a result of no longer requiring to pass that high temperature effluent across a cooling tower. But I just want to show a very quick animation that's probably going to show this concept a little bit more clearly.
So thank you for bearing with me uh, through that uh, short video. So another another product that has just been launched is something that is really helping our own internal engineers uh, to understand the operational efficiency of our client's wider steam trap population. And by utilizing a handheld uh, trap monitoring uh, device, it means that the efficiency of the trap is able to send a signal to um, a, a laptop or a tablet, for example, which can in turn um, interrogate that information and compile a report that can be sent to a central cloud. And that report can be downloaded by our clients wherever they may be located in the world to get a broader efficiency of the not just the individual trap, but the wider process, the plant, and the organization's entire steam trap population. So again, that information can be accessible in real time, which helps our clients to really drill down and uh, minimize any losses that may be experienced by a trap that either isn't operating efficiently or may have failed altogether. And we can actually take that one step further we can move towards um, a digitally enhanced steam system. So um, if we consider a traditional steam system, the processors are typically capable of sending a signal back from the individual control valves, steam traps, varial speed drive pumps, boiler controls, flow meters, etc. Typically, they can send a signal back to a PLC or, or a BMS for, for diagnosis at some point in time. Whereas if we can move towards a digitally enhanced system, then all of these various components and controls could be capable of interacting with each other and sending that information back remotely over a cloud-based storage system. So that information can be um, downloaded and interrogated anywhere in the world. So there are a number of key benefits here. For one, it means that if our client were to have an issue or a problem or any inefficiency with a process or a steam trap, it means that there isn't going to be any lengthy delay between them identifying the issue, calling an engineer on site to diagnose the problem, sending away from a, for a service engineer to come back to site, sometimes on multiple occasions to rectify a problem, all of which is going to have an ongoing impact with regards to ongoing energy efficiency, maybe even process and quality or, or health and safety implications. And if we've got multiple trips to and from site to rectify a problem, then, of course, there's a, a, a green and sustainability issue there. But if we can move towards a digitally enhanced system, it means that not only is it possible to diagnose issues that occur in real time, it means that it's possible that uh, uh, any number of third parties can diagnose those issues on behalf of the Steam using client. They can do that off-site. But it means that as Steam engineers, we could perhaps also offer support to our Steam using clients remotely. We can help them to identify and rectify these issues themselves. So, of course, that's reducing the amount of trips to and from a client site. And it means that those inefficiencies, those process quality or health and safety issues can be addressed in real time. But the one thing to bear in mind is we've looked at concepts that are likely to be coming up in the elevator. These are concepts. Um, to remind us what is likely to be achievable in the coming months or years. It's critically important that we remember the basics. And we've gone through the basics in previous presentations. We need to remember that these new concepts and these new products, there are, it's not an elastoplast that we can use to repair an existing or traditional steam system. Sure, we can employ these new concepts to ensure that we're generating steam efficiently from sustainable or green sources. But unless we're doing everything we can to minimize demand, demand reduction, and actually utilize the steam more efficiently, then we're simply wasting our time. So the basics are always going to have the place. And when we're talking about employing the basics, 
We're talking about ensuring that those steam traps have been sized, selected, installed, maintained correctly. And it's critically important that we're going to be auditing or monitoring the steam trap condition periodically. We can do that in terms of a manual audit, or we can do that using some form of a digitally enhanced device. We want to ensure that we're keeping the temperature of the feed water at a higher point as possible. We want to keep the feed water, if it's being utilized in a vented atmospheric deaerator, commonly known as a hot well, we want to keep the temperature as hot as we possibly can from freely available energy. In other words, returning condensate. We want to keep that water at a temperature of around 85 degrees. By doing so, we're generating steam more responsively in the boiler to meet demand. We need to consume far, far less fuel to raise steam compared to if we're putting cold water into the boiler. Of course, we're going to get less thermal fatigue of the boiler, and it means we've purged off more of the air and the other non-condensable gases, which you'll remember can cause corrosion and can have an insulating effect at the point of heat exchange. So we've mentioned we want to recover as much of the condensate as possible, meaning we want to have a correctly sized, selected and installed condensate recovery pump. We know that a condensate recovery pump, especially when it's electrically configured, we know it can only move condensate when it's a single phase liquid at a temperature of 97 degrees or less, which means that fall in pressure is going to result in flash steam losses at the vent. We'll come on to how we can address that in a few slides time. We also know that we need to engineer the steam distribution network to remove and recover that liquid condensate, two benefits there. It keeps the steam as dry as we possibly can, meaning there's more energy contained within the steam. So the process is going to take place more efficiently. But by recovering that liquid condensate that doesn't have any valuable energy to be used by the process, we can get it back to the boiler house to elevate the temperature of the hot well. We want to dry the steam in the boiler house and ahead of the process. Again, the drier the steam, the more energy there is contained within the steam. We want to reduce heat losses by keeping the insulation at the best possible level that we can. We want to keep the blowdown losses to an absolute minimum. We want to move away from manual blowdown controls and we want to move towards a, a timed actuator on the bottom blowdown valve. And conductivity probes ahead of a modulating valve to address the TDS blowdown. By keeping the TDS and the bottom blowdown at the prescribed level, we can reduce those heat losses significantly. But ultimately, we want to do everything we can to minimize any venting steam. That could be either from flash steam or it could be from any steam traps that have been failed in the open position. We want to do everything we can, first of all, to minimize or eliminate those losses, or further still, look at different ways in which that heat energy can be utilized. So let's look at those, uh, let's look at those steam vents in a little bit more detail. As we've mentioned, that venting steam, it could be as a result of uh, flash steam, if we've got a significant pressure drop going across a steam trap, or it could be as a result of failed open steam traps. The visual telltale is generally very easy to see, especially on a, a cold and wet day when that steam is being vented into atmosphere. We just need to think about different ways that we can address that steam that is ultimately being lost. So if we've got a significant load, we can perhaps look at ways that we can put that heat energy into another heat sink. The solution that you can see over towards the left hand side of the screen is what we call a flash recovery energy management equipment. So we take the flash steam, we also take the residual condensate if there's any that exists at the process and we pass those two different phases across the different area of a heat exchanger to add that heat energy to another heat sink. A perfect heat sink to add the energy to it is going to be the boiler feed water. Not always possible, um, but we need, really need to think creatively 
with regards to where that flash steam exists and what we can do with that heat energy. Now, if we can't realistically add that heat energy to any other process or any other heat sink, we want to at least try and condense that flash steam. Because if we're losing that flash steam or that plant steam that's arising from a steam trap, if it's venting to atmosphere, not only is it representative of a significant loss of energy, but it means we don't have the opportunity to recover that liquid condensate. It's simply disappearing into the atmosphere. So if you look over towards the right hand side of the screen, we can see an example of an exhaust vent condenser. And by passing that flash steam across a very simple heat exchanger, it means we're condensing a significant mass of that flash steam. We're letting that flash steam uh, expand as it sees atmospheric. But at least if we're recovering some of the heat energy, we're increasing the mass of condensate that we can otherwise return back to the boil house. And Another area that we can give thought to, it's not exactly a new concept, but it, it is a concept that hasn't been uh, widely utilized in the UK at the moment. It's what we refer to as a pressurized deaerator. So as we've mentioned, traditionally, we're going to keep that condensate that's returning from the process in a vented receiver or a hot well. And we can only keep that at atmospheric conditions where we know the maximum temperature is typically 85 degrees. But by pressurizing that vessel in a PDA, if we elevate the pressure to 0.2 bar gauge, it means we can now elevate the temperature of that feed water to around 105 degrees. And that's going to bring us a number of different benefits. So first of all, higher temperature water, well, it means the boiler is going to respond more rapidly. It means we get less thermal stress placed on the boiler. And of course, it means we need to consume far, far less fuel to generate steam. If we're bringing water into the boiler at 105 as opposed to 85 degrees. Other benefits at that high pressure, it means that we've purged off that oxygen and the non-condensable gases mechanically. We don't need to add anywhere near as many water conditioning chemicals. So if we've got less oxygen, fewer, fewer gases present within the steam, we get less corrosion of the pipework. We get a better condition of steam being produced. We need to perform far, far less blowdown because there's going to be a lower TDS level within the water. Less blowdown, that means fewer energy losses. But ultimately, it means that we've now found a way that we can actually utilize that flash steam. By directing those flash steam losses back towards the pressurized deaerator, it ultimately means that we can use that flash steam and we're moving, a, we're moving very, very close towards a point where we've got a zero loss system. Of course, we may be using a very, very small amount of steam as that's being used to move the air across the air vent, but we can typically condense that very small amount of steam in a very, very similar exhaust vent condenser. So just to summarize very, very quickly on what we've gone through today, the first point I'd like to make is before we move towards a situation where we're looking at new concepts that we could employ in future years, the basics, they're always going to apply. They've always got the place, regardless of how we're generating steam. We want to reduce demand. We want to do everything we can to keep the steam as dry as we possibly can. Simply put, the drier the steam, the more energy. If we can reduce the demand for steam or utilize the steam at the process more efficiently, if we're consuming less steam, we're consuming less fuel, and we've got fewer carbon emissions. We know that it's going to be possible to move towards a solution where we can generate steam from those existing traditional steam boilers simply by retrofitting the fossil fuel burners out for an alternative source of fuel. For example, moving towards a hydrogen burner or moving towards an electrical heater element. 
if we can move towards a pressurized DA rater, then we're going to add a significant amount of cost savings that can be realized from a number of different areas. But ultimately, regardless of how we're generating steam, we want to ensure that we're embracing digitalization. We want to ensure that we're able to address any inefficiencies that may occur in real time instantaneously. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, bearing with us today and through the suite of presentations that we've delivered to date. If there is any appetite for further education, uh, Spirax Sarko have got a number of um, on-site training facilities uh, around the world where we offer a range of training courses. I'd encourage you to look at our website for further details there. And we've also got the eighth and final a CPD presentation uh, in the diary for the 20th of July, when we're going to look at the topic of steam quality in a little bit more detail. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, bearing with us on today's presentation. If there have been any questions, then please don't hesitate to um, drop them into the chat function now. But if I can ask uh, my colleagues, uh, Steve, or, or if Brian's there, then uh, please do feel free to read out any questions that they may have been, and I'll do what I can to uh, address them. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for uh, another excellent presentation. A uh, number of questions, as you can imagine, uh, obviously a thought-provoking topic, the, uh, the future of steam. Um, and I'll start uh, with the questions around the electrical steam generation side of things, if I may. Um, so we've got a couple of those come in. So it's a question, uh, two-part question, really, from Alan who's asking uh, for electric steam generation, would there be an upper size limit? Um, and also how would superheated steam be generated? Thinking specifically of turbine plants. Right, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the upper size, um, typically that would be governed by the electricity supply in the local area. So on a, on a theoretical level, then it would just be a case of uh, sizing, the, uh, sizing the boiler and sizing the element appropriately. However, we do need to think about what is uh, uh, realistically going to be feasible within the realms of the, the, the existing infrastructure. So moving forward towards sustainable and green steam production, it's highly likely that steam is going to be generated from a number of different sources. For example, uh, we could have um, an electrical element that is utilized on an existing steam boiler that may be supplemented by a thermal store or a thermal battery, for example. Uh, with regards to superheated steam, um, again, um, uh, Spirax Sarko's uh, sister company also manufacture um, superheaters. And they would be uh, they would be well positioned to assist there, uh, but there's no reason why that steam, whether it's generated from uh, traditional fossil fuel sources or via an electrical steam boiler, wouldn't be able to be utilised for um, uh, superheated steam applications. Excellent. So lots of lots of scope there, just really limited by um, infrastructure, like a lot of other technologies, I guess. So yeah, excellent, good. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, another another question on a on a similar note, actually. Um, within what time frame are you expecting the electrical solutions, uh, i.e., boiler elements and thermal store, to be commercially available? Well, our 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 sister company, uh, Chromalox, are already manufacturing standalone electrical steam generators. They're already being manufactured. What is a, what's at a, a reasonably advanced stage is looking at the possibilities of uh, retrofitting one of their elements onto an existing steam boiler. So, if a client was looking for um, uh, if a client was looking for a brand new energy centre, or if they were simply looking to replace a traditional steam boiler that had come to the end of its existing life, then it is possible to adopt um, a brand new electrical steam generator, but it's the retrofitting part that is at, a, is at a reasonably early stage, shall we say. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and there's a question from uh, Thomas with regard to the some of the cloud-based solutions that you were talking about. 
So he's asking, uh, with respect to the cloud-based remote connection to Steam systems, uh, digitally enhanced, would this not create a new risk to the energy generation system, leaving it open to cyber attacks? And how do you plan to combat the, this risk? That's a very good question. Uh, and the short answer there is um, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, we do have a dedicated team that is uh, is a very, very advanced stage of working on that. What I would say, Thomas, is if you'd like to drop me an email, I, I will look into that and I will ask that question of, of our digitalization team for you. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Dan. Uh, sorry, just bear with me. Just trying to get on to the next one. So... Um, We've also got a further question uh, regarding uh, other topics, actually. So um, great insight regarding the future of STEAM from an energy and sustainability viewpoint. But are there any uh, other areas where STEAM engineering looks likely to change shape in the near future? Um, yes, that, that's something we're going to discuss in, uh, in more detail at the next presentation, which is on the 20th. Um, we had originally intended to deliver that particular presentation a few weeks ago, but we, we had a couple of technical issues, so we're, we're out of sequence there. Simply put, steam quality is increasing in importance um, uh, over recent years, and that's because uh, consumers are starting to appreciate the fact that steam actually, well, steam is sterile. But it's the way that we generate it and the way that we distribute it that can result in steam finding its way to a process, resulting in a, a risk of contamination. For example, it's the chemicals that we add to the water in the boiler. It's the air that is present in the distribution network that can result in a little bit of corrosion. So if we're adding water treatment chemicals, if we're adding uh, corrosion or rust from the carbon steel pipework into a process, then that is a risk of contamination. So imagine if you if you imagine if you're working in a food production facility. We've got an excess of moisture going into a product. We've got a risk of rust or scale finding its way into a product. Then it could well be that that product can no longer be considered organic, for example. It may no longer um, satisfy the requirements of those that have got uh, uh, dietary expectations, for example, um, halal food or kosher food. It may even mean that um, we're at risk of adding unwanted particulate, such as uh, scale, rust, heavy metals into that food. So more and more industries recognize the importance of generating their steam at a quality that is significantly in advance of traditional steam boilers. And that's something that we're going to look at in uh, some considerable detail in uh, on the 20th of July. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, keep my powder dry there, Steve. If you <laughs> that's fine, Dan. Yeah, lovely. OK, look forward to that. Then that'll be uh, very, very interesting and informative by the sound of it. Um, so I can see the final couple of questions that have come in are actually related to um, people that have perhaps missed a couple of the previous sessions and are asking about recordings of the previous presentations. That you've okay. Delivered. Uh, so maybe, uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to uh, address those uh, in your, your closing comments, perhaps. Would that be the best way of doing that? Yeah, I will do. And, right, so uh, there, are, there, are there any other, any good that, other questions, Steve, or is, is that it? That's the rest of the questions. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, questions today. And thank you, Dan, for uh, another excellent presentation. Not at all. And please, anybody, if you do have any further questions, please reach out to me on uh, on LinkedIn or email me directly. I'll do what I can to support you. Please do think about downloading that Spirax Sarko um, app. Um, uh, Thomas, if you'd like to reach out to me, I'll, I'll gladly answer the question on digitalization that I wasn't able to, to answer during the presentation. So thanks once again to, uh, uh, to, to Brian and Fiona. Uh, apologies, I spoke over you at the beginning, Brian. I don't know if you were on mute, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass over to you for, the, for your closing statements. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, again, brilliant uh, presentation. Brilliant lecture. Um, yeah, apologies for the 
technical issues with sound at the beginning and thanks Dan for picking up the slack there. Uh, it's brilliant. Okay, so um, the previous lectures are up on the iMechie uh, YouTube channel, um, which you can access via the, uh, the iMechie website, um, or you can go directly to uh, YouTube and find it that way. Um, the, the, they're all uh, up there. Um, this one will take a few days before it arrives. Um, finally, some thanks. Uh, thanks for all you guys for connecting into this. Uh, I enjoy listening to Dan. Interesting every time. Um, thanks to Nikki and Fiona uh, for the support with uh, getting the, the show on the road. Um, and as, as always, a big thank you to Spyrak Sarko, uh, Dan and Stephen. And also thanks to the team at uh, Project Solutions for supporting me because without them, I wouldn't be able to get the show on the road. So hopefully um, you guys will all connect in again on the 20th of July uh, when Dan will give you an update on the quality of Steam. So thanks very much and have a good day. Bye.